That's Nick. And that's Joseph, and today we're here to talk about The Fugitive Kind, which was released, re-released uh, on Criterion on Blu-ray on January 14th, 2020. It's a 1960 film uh, directed by Sidney Lumet, uh, based on the play Orpheus Descending by Tennessee Williams. It stars Marlon Brando and Anna Magnani. Marlon Brando, Anna Magnani, also known as La Magnani, uh, Joanne Woodward, Maureen Stapleton, and others. And others. <laughs> Do you want to describe the plot? Sh uh, sure. It's set in a small southern town, uh, and Brando plays Val Snakeskin Xavier, so named for the snakeskin jacket that he wears. He's a guitar player, singer, who's, uh, we come to learn, is a gigolo uh, that's kind of drifting through these cities and ne'er do well that nobody wants in town. Uh, so he lands in this burg uh, where uh, the sheriff's wife, played by Maureen Stapleton, uh, says, oh, if you're, if you're giving up your... Uh, Evil ways. Evil ways. What do they call them? In the, the, if you're done going to those night places, I can find a job for you at the mercantile store run by Anna Magnani, who's in this uh, terrible relationship with this older man named Jabe. Uh, he hits it off with uh, Lady Torrance, played by Man Magnani, and uh, gets a job. And uh, then there's also a subplot involving uh, Joan Woodward as the white trash vagrant um, who knows about his past and tries to take advantage of it. Sorry, okay. that was a, sort of my usual uh, verbose <laughs> synopsis. Yeah, like a gigolo comes into town, mm -hmm. he makes friends with like the general store lady and they end up things kind of decline. They have a romance, things, yeah. end, things end tragically. So this, I mean obviously this is an important movie and it's a good movie, otherwise it wouldn't have a Criterion release. Well, uh, that's arguable, but yeah, Well, but sure. I mean it is... Uh, it's a stamp of quality. It, yeah, and, and I think it's valid. So I just thought we could talk about what works. Well, did, what doesn't do you want work? to talk about some of the other things before we get there? Sure. So this is directed by Sidney Lumet. Um, he, of course, had one of the greatest uh, directorial debuts of all time with 12 Angry Men. In 57. He did a couple other films before this and, and then uh, directed this Tennessee Williams adaptation, uh, which Williams was the talk of the town through the 40s, 50s, into early 60s, and this was kind of a first bigger failure because before this, you know, we had Suddenly Last Summer, uh, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, uh, Streetcar Named Desire, uh, Summer and Smoke, all these films that had Oscar nominated roles uh, and performers, uh, all that were hit Broadway plays. First. So this was kind of like, not the beginning of the end, but it was the first big failure for Williams. Mm -hmm. um, so Marlon Brando was the first uh, actor ever to score a million dollars for a role, and it was in this film. Uh, and it was a failure at the box office. The cast and crew did not get along. Uh, Anna Magnani made a pass at Brando at a hotel prior to filming, and he turned her down, uh, which kind of jolted her a bit. Uh, Brando and Woodward did not get along, apparently for reasons that are unknown. Um, Maureen Stapleton originated the role on Broadway, and here she is cast in a lesser role. <laughs> Brando, of course, starred in Williams' earlier Streetcar Named Desire, which was made him famous, and Anna Magnani won an Oscar for The Rose Tattoo in 1955, which Tennessee Williams wrote expressly for her. Um, Woodward was already an Oscar winner at this time for The Three Faces of Eve. Um, there's just a lot going on. Plus, not to mention that Williams, after successful plays, retooled an old play into this, which is Orpheus Descending. Angelina Jolie, by the way, has a tattoo from the original text on her body. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really a reconstitution of uh, the Greek myth of uh, Orpheus and Eurydice. Orpheus, who goes down to hell to retrieve Eurydice, and he makes a deal with Hades that he can take her back, but he can never look behind him to see that she's following, and of course he does. And, that's kind of a, a, an obvious subtext of this. It was shot by Boris Kaufman, uh, who uh, also, also shot 12 Angry Men, and who's the brother of Ziga, Ver Ziga Vertov, the Soviet filmmaker who did a uh, Man with a Camera. That, I don't know, that I, I love this movie. This has a special place in my heart. I know you can heart. talk for um, hours about yes, this film, but we have like three minutes left. So I think, so for someone who's not as familiar with the source material, the 
you know, I don't have the same love for this piece as you do. What I will say is I do really like this film. I think it's worth watching solely for, not solely, but I think if nothing, if for no other reason, Anna Magnani is. Oh God, yeah. There's like When I think of like acting, mm -hmm. like, like a real actor, not theater, but just like someone who, when they get on the screen, they just have it. Like, I think her in this film is what I think of like an actor. Oh yeah. I mean, some people criticized her throughout her career of like being, you know, she's bigger than life. They called her La Magnani. But I don't think she's like, oh, she's intense. She is intense, very intense, but I love it. I, I really enjoy it. I don't think it's over the top. Uh, she, and there's, there are two scenes in particular, and like, I've seen this film many times, and I tear up every time. Like, it's so, when she confronts her past lover, who she had once been pregnant with, and, and, and these, these people burned down her father's uh, vineyard because he sold, uh, he was a bootlegger and sold liquor to some um, black people, and this is in the South. And it just, I, I don't know. Like, it gets- Well, I feel like we need to spoil the st or you don't want to do no, that. No, we can spoil it. I mean, it's, this is a 1960 film. So, so part of um, Anna Magnani's character's misery is that she, so the town tramp that, who's played John by- John Woodward. Her brother was in a relationship with Anna Magnani's character and kind of like left her high and dry. Unbeknownst to him, she was pregnant with his child when he left her. Which she miscarried. Which she ended up uh, losing the baby. But for these, for all these years, she believed that he was responsible for her father's vineyard mm -hmm. or orchard being uh, set aflame. Mm -hmm. But in a fit of rage from her current husband uh, against Marlon Brando's character, he starts yelling at him and retelling the story of how the vineyard was set, or the orchard was set on fire. Is it a vineyard or an orchard? Uh, I thought it was a vineyard. Okay, sorry, a vineyard. He spills the tea and says that he was part of who was responsible. Mm -hmm. So not her ex, you so, know. And, and she confesses that to her old lover that just as uh, she, he sold himself into a marriage with a society girl, she sold herself too. Because that's the other theme of the film. That's why it's called The Fugitive Kind, because there's a speech about how there are two kinds of people, those who buy and those who are bought. But maybe there's a third kind, a fugitive kind. So the film ends with Anna Magnani's character's husband. Well, she, ta she takes all this time and makes her own con the, uh, confectionery. She builds onto the store and she wants to have the nightlife for the town. And okay. it's kind of like her personal revenge. And so on the eve of it being uh, uh, its debut, it gets burned down. Well, her husband burns it down. Mm -hmm. And shoots her and kills her, mm -hmm. <laughs> and she's pre and she's also pregnant again with Marlon with Brando's, Marlon Brando's baby. baby. Which so is it's very dramatic. Oh yes, yes. But we need to wrap this up. So what works? I think Anna Magnani is just like that's like a classic performance. I like the story. Mm -hmm. Some of the dialogue is a little over the top. It is, but it works. I think what doesn't work is the casting of Marlon Brando as this like. He's he's supposed to be he's supposed to be oozing sex. Well, he's a gigolo. This wild creature, right? That's that's shedding his skin, literally. But Marlon Brando looks so uncomfortable in his own skin mm -hmm. as an actor, and it translates on the screen. First of all, he's kind of he's past his prime. I think. Sure. No. Yeah. He, he is yeah. like he's not in shape. He his face. You know, he's supposed to be thirty. I think he looks older. He's thirty five in the film. He. He's supposed to be oozing sex, but it's very sort of like he he's peacocking and it's almost kind of embarrassing to mm -hmm. watch, in my opinion. Sure. But still good. I just think that, you know, I have watched this film previously as well. And I think seeing it again, it kind of highlights that the man that the actor was, he had some demons. And I think some of the lore of like him being such a great actor is maybe um over evaluated maybe <laughs> i don't know that's controversial well, I, guess. I mean he has won two oscars one before and after this but uh yeah i, I don't know i he's i like him uh, i'm not a diehard fan of his but you know i i was thinking 
he he does play as past his prime in this, but like I thought James Dean would have made a better yeah who's Val already dead by then yeah but you know what's interesting is the fact that it seems like a good idea to cat this is where like reality and fiction sometimes collapse in Hollywood where of course Marlon Brando is a woman the a person women would swoon over but it's only because in their mind he is. Stanley Kowalski from, right, from, right. from nine years earlier. Right. So it, 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 on paper it makes sense, but in reality it's like, oh, maybe he, it should have been him. In this film, I'm preoccupied with seeing Marlon Brando, mm -hmm. not the actual character, and seeing that it's, it's not completely laughable, but it's very close to being laughable that that man would be this character <laughs> to me. But uh, I would give this film three and a half out of five stars. Um, this film has, uh, I think this is my first introduction to Anna Magnani originally, and I went off on a craze after that, and I still feel exactly the same for her watching this. Um, uh, <clears throat> it doesn't rank as great as Suddenly Last Summer for me, but this film uh, gets a four and a half out okay. of five for me. Uh, the Criterion's re-release, because this was... That, um, about a decade ago was part of the collection. It's on Blu-ray now. Uh, four out of five. And just so you know, uh, there's some special features, including a 2009 Sydney Lumet interview. Um, they include three plays that Lumet of Tennessee Williams that short plays that Lumet did for television from 1958. And there's a 2010 segment on Tennessee Williams' uh, work in Hollywood. Is that all? Yeah. All right. Bye. Bye.